Hey, uh, my name is Jack, and I want to do a quick overview of our stair climbing robot. Uh, stair climbing robots seem to be a really common class project in college and high school, and they're really a great place to exercise some interesting engineering design creativity and practice good manufacturing methods. So I built this as a sophomore college class project for one of my classes. Uh, me and two other people were on this team, Arkin and Eli, want to shout them out. Uh, we named the team Elogofusio Hippopocornorius just for fun because it's a nice long word that means very good. But diving more into the details, why am I making this video? I'm making this video specifically to overview at a somewhat higher level uh, the math we did and the design choices we made for our robot that allowed it to succeed relatively well. In addition, I'm also making this video to make sure I reference any sources that we did use in making this robot to point you to those learning resources so you can continue to maybe dive deeper into building stair climbing robots as I'm assuming if you're here you might have been assigned a similar project or if you're watching this for fun hopefully I make it pretty entertaining if not maybe a little informative. Alright let's get right into it. First uh, we start with brainstorming. What's the goal? Get up the stairs. We don't necessarily care that well about driving on flat ground but since it would be a uh, sort of nice to have our first two brainstormed ideas did revolve around that a bit. Um, these were the mass shifter robot. You've got a series of linear slides oriented up and down, combined with three separate stages of the robot with driven wheels on each of them that allow you to then articulate and move the robot over a variety of obstacles. Second, we have a tank robot. It's relatively self-explanatory what this is. Um, we had about 13 other brainstormed ideas, uh, but it's good to note that if you're doing, say, the mass shifter or tank dread, which are two that we did continually come back to, for the mass shifter, really think about your movement patterns. The drawn one that we have on the left of the screen here is actually overcomplicated and definitely just more of a vague concept of what we could do. In reality, you can do a mass shifting or vertical linear slide style stair climber um, with usually probably only one vertical linear rail and two sets of driven wheels. I'll let you figure out how that one can go together, but we did prove it and it could work. It'd be very fun. Um, as for tank treads, look on the bottom right. You will see the two larger sprockets and then two small idle, probably spring-loaded sprockets that we could have on the bottom. If you're doing a tank tread like this, please make sure to have more sprockets because you, if you have a long tread because you want to ensure relatively even contact with the stairs. You don't want your tread being able to flex too much out of that plane that you ideally want it running in. Right, our third brainstorm idea and what we actually used, we call rimless wheels. I'd like to cite this source that we wound up using of a tri-spoked mechanism for fast stair climbing. I should have previously pulled this up, but if you take a look and Google what I just Googled, you will wind up seeing a really cool, interesting paper and pre-existing robot design that you'll see is very similar to ours, in which they analyzed a bit of stair climbing mechanisms for this general wheel shape. Going back to our robot, you can see it's going to be a very similar thing with a few key differences. Number one, and really the big difference, is we made it lighter and we made it purpose-built for climbing stairs fast. This robot is purpose-built for climbing stairs well and collecting a lot of data while doing it. We don't need the data. We just need to go up the stairs, which meant we could spend a bit more time on our engineering um, on that front versus, say, outfitting with a bunch of sensors and making it modular to configure different designs over the course of, say, an experiment. We knew what we wanted, and we wound up going to make it. So, when you're determining exactly how we're going to make which design, you may want to consider using a decision matrix. That's what this slide's all about. If you know what a decision matrix is, skip ahead like 45 seconds. But, in our case, you list your design criteria on the left, uh, your design choices that you can choice between on the top. Uh, we were choosing, as mentioned, tank robot, rimless wheels, and mass shifter with a variety of different design criteria. Um, I would recommend for everything, every choice your team makes, document it somewhere. Uh, we used Google Drive and a running engineering journal in which, okay, one of our criteria is operational stability. And then we justify why that is a criteria, what that criteria actually means. Because if I say operational stability to someone, it could mean a variety of things. Like, you could just say, oh, is the robot well built? I guess it's operationally stable. In our case, operational stability actually came down to if the robot is drifting left or right on the stairs, does it course correct or does it accentuate that drift? 
or and how fast does a drift get magnified? Let's take the tank robot as an example. Uh, we also then justify our point all allocation of one for the tank robot in operational stability. And I'll explain how and why, just like I did for this engineering justification. The tank robot got a one on operational stability. And the reason for that is because if your tank robot is going relatively quickly up the stairs, as is the design intent, and veering, say, to the left, then the right tread hits first. That right tread will push the robot further to the left extremely quickly, causing the robot to likely get off path and possibly have issues. That's an example of, you know, having our design criteria, justifying the point allocation, and finally you put it all in your decision matrix, your DCM, assess the output. What does assess the output mean? Well, you've got your weighted totals here, um, and we see that the rimless wheels, or tri-spoked curve mechanism, won at 4.3. It's your highest value, right? Uh, decision matrix can be used to create a numerical sense of frame of reference, right? So you look at your decision matrix and say, did this output something that my engineering common sense tells me is probably true? And as you do more decision matrices over time and come to trust how you build them, you can start doing decision matrices for, say, a project that I'm currently doing that has about 180 criteria for five designs. And that's when really um, knowing and justifying every single number in the matrix starts to be really important. So I recommend you guys spend time with this. It's super fun. Uh, moving on, here's more about how we ranked our individual um, criteria on the tri-spoke mechanism. And then here's some geometry we did for the tri-spoke mechanism. Uh, you've got your key formula there of radius of a single spoke is going to be 3L over 2 pi. Uh, you can take a look at this paper as previously mentioned up here. You'll see a bit more detail how we got into that. Um, then this 5.98 centimeters and 7.76 centimeters are both calculated guess estimates given the rise and run of our staircase. Overall, with this design, if we're talking about how it moves, you're thinking of rolling up the stairs instead of pulling up the stairs. You're assuming a non-slip rolling condition between these two red surfaces, the flat red surface being that of the stair and the top red surface, the curved one, being that of your wheel. Uh, this means that as you go from state A to B to C, which you can lay out in a solid work sketch real quick, um, you kind of see how that center of gravity, or at least center of rotation, is moving in a relatively straight line. Uh, that's where the next part of our design comes in. We want to line up our center of gravity with our center of rotation to basically minimize the forces that are being transmitted throughout the robot. Here's the wheel when you map it all the way out. I'm going to get into motor selection real quick. This is an important part of this project if you were, say, carrying weight. We just had to go fast, and our robot only weighed 7 pounds, so we were relatively good. Um, this is your worst case stall calculation um, at the outset of the largest possible uh, radius of the wheel. Um, torque equals that radius R2 up here across your force, aka your weight of the robot. Convert it to metric because that's what we did everything in. Uh, find your torque. It's going to be 7.4 newton meters. Slap a factor of safety on it. And then given that we wanted each wheel to independently take the load, if not perfectly in sync when turning on stairs, we knew we were looking for a motor with about 19 newton or 18.5 newton meters of stall torque. Um, these are motor graphs. They come with basically any motor that you could be selecting. You can find them online. Take a look at your x-axis. That's torque. Y-axis, RPM. So stall torque. What does that mean? RPM is at zero. Let's go find our torque on the corresponding graph. Then we can see what? No, we have like 1400 gram centimeters. That, that seems wrong. Well, convert to Newton meters and it's now really small. That's because with a lot of these motors, you're going to be putting a reduction gearbox on the end. You're reducing that output speed, increasing the torque up. We did a 139 reduction gearbox on our motor, bringing us to a 19 newton meter stall torque, which when compared to our 18.5 newton meter required stall torque is satisfactory. Right, uh, running calculations, similar deal here. Uh, since we were able to relatively assume that non-slip condition of velocity of center gravity CG is more or less equal to our omega times R1, uh, do some math of what your desired climb rate is, just pull that one out of your hat, we chose two and a half steps per second, it, it sounded relatively good, um, and then eventually you can get down, work down this math, it's pretty simple, and you'll get to 6,000 RPM at your motor, in our case, uh, run it back through your torque performance graph on the left, so we're wanting 5963 RPM at motor, 
Okay, the motor we selected has a torque graph. That means when you're at about that 6,000 RPM at motor, you're getting peak torque. That's what you're looking for. You don't want to be at 6,000 RPM and all the way down over here, uh, not, you know, maybe not getting, or well, you'd be getting a lot of torque out of it at that point, but you'd be at a really low RPM, uh, which maybe you want. But optimizing your curves is really nice. Here's the motor we chose with all that said and done. One motor on each wheel. RC controlled, mind you, to ensure synchronization. Uh, that is important. For machining, aluminum hubs, plastic ones are likely to fail, particularly when we printed them in like two hours with a super low infill. And if you're 3D printing stuff, uh, know that the further in you get towards your wheels, the um, higher the torques and bending moments. Um, and then the further out, that's why we're able to let it get thinner is because those bending moments are less. You can see our slicer down here. The color is just for fun. Those hexagons do nothing. Um, here's our assembled and exploded view because they're pretty and we had to include them for the class. And then finally, some other manufacturing stuff, right? Part of this is make it nice and light. It'll be able to go slightly faster. There'll be less inertia to overcome when you're accelerating, right? Um, we put a hexagonal pattern on the front face of our main 2x2 two two beam, that this one that runs left right in this CAD, uh, just to make it a bit lighter. We also put some slots on the tail using just a mill, which I recommend because, frankly, we didn't go into this knowing all these tools super well. Uh, mill, CNC, none of it. But we'd heard of them, we'd heard the theory, we'd played around with them once or twice, and so through this project and through projects like this, it's really advantageous both for mine and hopefully yours learning experience to kind of play around with that stuff, right? Like the slots we actually wound up cutting in this rear tail, some of them were deviating left and right, because in one case I forgot to accidentally lock the x-axis of the mill and deviated the thing probably about, I don't know, five hundredths of an inch, and you could visibly see that. It looked bad. Nonetheless, it wasn't too structurally critical because we were learning. And we knew that we were learning, so we gave us ourselves the tolerance and space on these robots and in these projects to allow for learning. And I think that's important, and if there's one thing you take away from the video, let it be that. These projects are meant for you to learn, so push your limits a bit, have some fun, and build some cool stuff. Uh, speaking of cool stuff, here's the robot going up the stairs. We're pretty pleased with it. So there you can probably see what I mean by the robot more or less rolling up the stairs. And then in conclusion, as with any good project, take a look and calculate maybe your um, output performance against your targets. And in our case, we saw we hit 2.3 steps per second. That's less than our 2.5 step per second goal. Um, so then finally you go back through and rank against your design criteria. And then you can actually measurably see how well do you think your design performed against your criteria. The goal isn't necessarily 10 out of 10s. I'd say like 7 out of 10s in the context of a class project are fine. The goal is that learning and having at the end of the class project the foresight of what would you change. Um, in conclusion, there are some future improvements. If you wanted to take our exact design, read this study and copy it verbatim, there are improvements you can make um, if you want to play around. First off, um, Pick some more powerful motors, make the thing go faster. Reduce the weight, make the things go faster. See these white skids on the end? Make them six inches longer to reduce scratching on this metal um, tailpiece. What else? Uh, yeah, going downstairs with these is actually a pain. So in this case, you probably would want more sensors because manually driving it down the stairs was a bit of an issue. And finally, uh, this is the fun one. You could improve driving on flat ground by using dimension shifting wheels. This is also in another study from that robotics laboratory. And so if you want to take the same principles and make a mechanically robust version of this, that's also super lightweight. You could have some real fun creating a robot that can not only climb stairs well, but also drive on flat ground. Anyways, I uh, hope this video, wow, we're almost at 15 minutes here. hope this video was at least interesting. Might have been a bit exhaustive in its length. But I hope you learned something about building cool stair climbing robots, my approach to robots in general, and nothing else. I hope you're entertained and have a nice day.